Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, I'm uh, Robert George. I'm one of the cardiologists um, here at AERC. Um, and I'm going to be talking about pulmonary hypertension today um, in dogs, uh, the presentation diagnosis and management. <clears throat> and you know, I think pulmonary hypertension is something that we've been identifying more and more. And um, you know, I'm sure it's been around for a while, but you know, I, I feel like you know, compared to probably 10 years ago, we probably weren't talking about it as much. But I think in this just this last week, I think I diagnosed it in at least five or six uh, patients. Um, so pretty common in what I'm seeing um, every day. Um, and I know pulmonary hypertension, there's a lot of questions about what it is, what it isn't, how you manage it, how it's different than heart failure, differentiating them. So I think, um, um, hopefully this will be an interesting topic to you and hopefully it'll be helpful for you um, in helping manage your patients with, with respiratory disease. Um, so we will uh, start by talking about uh, what is pulmonary hypertension and what is it, what isn't it. Um, there's uh, the classifications and causes of the different types of pulmonary hypertension. <coughs> Clinical findings, um, anywhere from signal mint, physical exam, diagnostic imaging, um, what history, like what, what you're going to find. Uh, the diagnostic evaluation that you should be doing or things that could be done and how they may help you diagnose and treat it, and then eventually the different ways to, to treat. Um, so the ACVIM earlier this year released a consensus statement um, about pulmonary hypertension, and this talk is kind of modeled based off of um, their recommendations and off this paper. So this paper is I kind of used as like the backbone of, of the talk. Uh, the ACVM consensus statements are all free to download. If you just do a search for ACVM consensus statements, it'll give you the list of all of them, and they're all for free to download and, and to read. So uh, you're welcome to, to grab that as well. I also pulled a bit of information from C the most recent version of CVT. Um, I really like CVT for it being kind of a nice consensus overview of different disease processes. This one's getting a few years old, um, and there's been some newer information since this was published, but um, I also think this is a good reference to um, for pulmonary hypertension in addition to other, other diseases as well. So the definition of pulmonary hypertension um, in people um, is having a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury or higher at rest. And um, one quote I like from the consensus statement is um, pulmonary hypertension is not a disease per se, but rather it's a hemodynamic and pathophysiologic state um, present in a wide variety of diseases. So having pulmonary hypertension isn't necessarily the diagnosis. It's something uh, that uh, comes along secondary to something else. Um, and depending what that causes, the management strategies can be very different. So um, hopefully as we go through this talk, we can try to help elucidate some of that. So uh, the, the primary focus of pulmonary hypertension obviously is the lungs, um, but from a, cardiologist's point of view, um, you know, I'm kind of looking at the heart and how that interacts with, with the lungs. Um, so, you know, just kind of basic physiology review, the right ventricle pumps blood into the main pulmonary artery, which then goes into the lungs. And as the arterioles branch more and more, um, it, the lungs are normally a, like a low pressure, low resistance, high capacitance system. So um, very, usually very low pressures, uh, lots of blood storage, lots of blood flow. And then as the, they branch down to the capillaries, um, the, that's where you get the gas exchange between the alveolar capillary interface. And then that oxygenated blood then goes into the pulmonary veins, which then travel into the left atrium and then eventually out to the body. So things that I'm looking at are going to be on both the, the inflow side, so from the right ventricle on, and then the outflow side, uh, the left atrium back. So those are the kind of the two things that uh, encompass the lungs, and both of those are going to have influence on pulmonary hypertension or not. 
Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the consensus statement, um, it, uh, it, it's a, it was a multidisciplinary um, panel and it consisted of uh, board certified internists, cardiologists, uh, emergency and critical care specialists, uh, diagnostic imaging and anatom anatomic pathology. Um, because pulmonary hypertension really is a multidisciplinary problem, um, you know, all, all of those specialties are very important in the management of these diseases. And it's nice that we have the perspective of all these different um, expertises in, in helping manage it. So what, what can happen though, is when you have this normal um, low resistance system, uh, different things can influence it. And the way my brain usually thinks about it is I think about things before the lungs, in the lungs, or after the lungs. <clears throat> so similar, like when you're thinking about pre-renal, renal, post-renal, pre-hepatic, post hepatic, post-hepatic, post um, the way my brain works is thinking about the lungs before or after. And so the, the three main ways that you can develop pulmonary hypertension is having increased blood flow. So trying to cram extra blood into the same size small tube, um, having increased resistance to flow within the lung, lungs themselves, or having something on the outflow um, in the pulmonary vein side or, or, or left atrium size, side causing a backup to the lungs. Um, so really those are kind of the three main categories. And then um, the, we're gonna talk about more specifics of what affects those um, and how the, there's a six, class, six part classification system that fits into to all of this. So those, the consensus statement kind of redefine the classifications a little bit. I think if you look in CVT, I think they only have five classifications, but in the consensus statement, they came up with six. And it loosely follows the human classification of pulmonary hypertension um, with some modifications, uh, kind of specifically heartworm disease, because heartworm disease really doesn't happen in people. Um, so we're going to go through the classifications in a little bit more detail, um, but just as an overview, um, class one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. So uh, just the problem is specific to the pulmonary artery side of things, um, and that includes um, what's called pulmonary venoocclusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis which is a microscopic diagnosis, but things that are happening on the pulmonary artery side. Um, class two is pulmonary hypertension secondary to left heart disease. Um, and this one um, I think is very important, um, probably partially because I'm a cardiologist and it has the word heart in it. Um, but this, this one is managed very differently than a lot of the other ones. And when we talk about treatment, um, we'll talk about why that's different. Um, but uh, basically severe left heart disease can cause the backup of pressures into the lungs and cause pulmonary hypertension. Class three is pulmonary hypertension secondary to primary lung or airway disease or hypoxia. And this is the one that I think we see the most. Um, a lot of times we don't always get diagnoses, but this is the one at least I assume we're often seeing where we have an animal with primary lung disease, and that's eventually leading to high blood pressure in the lungs and pulmonary arteries <clears throat> and causing pulmonary hypertension. Class four would be PTEs or clots going out to the lungs, um, occluding the little um, arterioles, causing backup of pressure from things blocking blood flow. Class five is parasitic disease, um, so heartworm disease, um, Angiostrongylus um, is called French heartworm. Um, honestly, I don't know much about it. I probably should know more. Um, it's primarily a Western Europe disease, although um, it has been reported in the US. Um, instead of mosquitoes, I think like slugs and frogs are part of the, the life cycle. Um, so it's, it's at least something that is not recognized and maybe it's under-recognized here. Um, but no, heartworm is the main parasitic infection that we think about. And then class six is multifactorial, where a dog may have multiple of these classifications 
um, going at once or having an unclear mechanism. Um, but really a lot of the idiopathic ones um, are probably just on us not diagnosing it yet. Um, I feel like a lot of times we don't get answers and we make assumptions about cause. Um, but you know, I think as we learn more and more, we may start learning more and more about what which of these classifications are actually causing um, causing pulmonary hypertension. So just to talk about the classification in just a little bit more detail. Um, so again, class one primary pulmonary artery hypertension, um, idiopathic. Again, maybe we just don't know the answer yet. Um, but heritable issues, drugs, toxins. Um, or associated with other things. So congenital left to right shunts. Um, so either like VSDs or PDAs that are causing excessive um, blood flow. Um, you know, again, trying to cram extra blood into a certain size system that's not made for that volume of blood uh, can cause pulmonary hypertension and pressures to go up. And over time, that extra flow through the lungs can actually cause lung damage and may actually cause other types of pulmonary hypertension to develop, either reactive or primary lung disease. So a lot of these start to become interconnected and sometimes it's multifactorial. Um, but congenital cardiac shunts are one cause of this um, or just like a pulmonary vasculitis. Um, and people, they've di documented pulmonary vascular amyloid deposition so again, uh, probably a lot of things that we either dogs don't have or things that we have not documented yet. I talked a little bit about the, that pulmonary veno-occlusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. Um, this is, uh, there was a paper on this a few years ago. Um, it was like a vet path uh, paper. Um, it's uh, kind of consists of like severe and widely distributed like veno-occlusive remodeling affecting like the post-capillary venules and small veins. Um, and they also see like smooth muscle cell proliferation and like occlusion of lumens of those microscopic arterioles. So it's on a microscopic level, um, things that are causing pulmonary hypertension. And unless we're doing biopsies or histopath, you know, this may be something that we're missing and maybe under diagnosing. The class two, again, is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Um, and typical, so, you know, just kind of the, to recap, um, dogs with like, you know, severe left heart disease and congestive left heart failure, whether it be to dilated cardiomyopathy, degenerative valve disease, congenital heart diseases, um, as the left heart disease becomes more severe, blood starts to back up in the system. And as it does, that left atrium starts to enlarge. And after the left atrium gets significantly big and those pressures in that left atrium increase, the pressures keep backing up the pulmonary veins. You know, there's no valves between the left atrium and the pulmonary veins in the lungs. So those high left atrial pressures are backing up all the way to the lungs. Um, and it's that high hydrostatic pressure in those pulmonary capillaries that eventually causes fluid to ooze out of the capillaries into the lung tissue, which is what we call congestive heart failure, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward, like that's the heart failure that we see. But those high pressures can translate all the way through the lungs to the pulmonary artery to the right side of the heart. And I would say it's fairly common and even expected for a dog in congestive heart failure to have at least mild pulmonary hypertension. Um, in dogs in heart failure, they've documented left atrial pressures as high as 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury, um, and blood flows down pressure gradients. So in order to get that blood through the lungs and into that high pressure left atrium, you need to be generating more pressure than that. So if the left atrial pressure is 60, you, your pulmonary artery pressures may need to be 70 to 80 in order to push that blood into that left atrium. And again, normal pulmonary artery systolic pressures, are, I usually think are around 20 or so. So a dog could have severe pulmonary hypertension just trying to push this blood into this, through the lungs into this high pressure left atrium. 
And we'll talk about treatment um, towards the end of the talk. But you can imagine if we give a drug like sildenafil and dilate those pulmonary arteries and we drop that pulmonary artery pressure down to 60, then there's really no pressure gradient anymore. And the blood's going to essentially back up in the lungs, congest worse, worsen pulmonary edema, um, and the patient will probably die from worsened heart failure. Um, so that's, that's why I say, you know, it's important to try to understand what we're treating um, because treating a dog in active heart failure with sildenafil could cause it to decompensate. Uh, class three, again, this is the, this is like primary lung disease. And this is the one that I often assume is the main cause, um, or at least that's what we suspect. Uh, we often don't get a diagnosis. Um, in people, COPD, um, in dogs, we really don't see the same syndrome as them, but um, sometimes they can have obstructive um, airway disorders. Um, but primary pulmonary parenchymal diseases, so interstitial lung diseases, either uh, fibrotic, pneumonia, um, unclassified eosinophilic pneumonitis, um, infectious pneumonias, or even defulse, di diffuse pulmonary neoplasia um, can all cause lung disease, which can affect then eventually affect the capillaries and the pressure um, needed to push blood through those diseased lungs, leading to pulmonary hypertension. Um, in people, they have documented like upper airway obstructive disorders like sleep apnea, potentially being related to pulmonary hypertension. Um, so, you know, I always think about our brachycephalic dogs, um, whether that could be um, contributing or causing pulmonary hypertension. You know, the mechanism maybe isn't completely clear, um, but class three would be these primary lung issues. Class four would be PTEs or clots going to the lungs. Um, and that can be anything from chronic, small, tiny little microclots over time, slowly blocking more and more of the little arterioles until you get to a point where um, so many are blocked that the pressures are up to try to push blood out to the lungs. Or you could have an acute massive pulmonary thromboembolism where you know, a clot somewhere in the venous system in the body breaks loose, it goes through the right heart out to the lungs, and maybe it blocks a large branch. Um, and that sudden uh, blocking of blood flow can cause acute onset dyspnea or tachypnea. And sometimes you can even, that acute pressure load on the right ventricle can sometimes cause acute right ventricular dysfunction as well. Um, so yeah, it can be anything from chronic mild ones to acute massive. Class five, again, heartworm disease, um, something that we're relatively familiar with in Minnesota. Um, thankfully not as severe as um, some other states, uh, but we definitely do see it here, um, especially with, with some of the Southern transplant dogs. And then class six is pulmonary hypertension from uh, multiple causes, um, or um, they also include masses that are partially blocking the pul pulmonary arteries as class six as well. I've had a few dogs with heart-based masses or chemodectomas um, that are either invading or compressing the pulmonary artery, and, and that's causing a backup of pressure and increased pressure load on the heart and right heart failure. Um, so they would consider that class six. So let's move on to diagnosis. And um, like any disease, um, it's a kind of a multifactorial um, putting together all the clues that you have, all the way from signalment, clinical signs and history, your physical exam findings, and then diagnostic imaging results. And a lot of, a lot of this is not always slam dunk or straightforward. You know, a lot of times um, I'm thinking, you know, is this heart failure, is this pulmonary hypertension? And that's kind of a frequent, frequent reason that I get involved with ER cases. Um, and so when I'm going through these different things, I'm putting little check boxes and saying, uh, this is making me think more pulmonary hypertension. This is making me think more heart failure. Knowing that there's crossover, nothing slam dunk. But as I kind of tally up those in my head, I start to go in a direction of one or the other. So starting with signalment, 
Um, a puppies with pulmonary hypertension, I'm gonna have congenital cardiac shunts on the high, high on my list, developmental lung diseases. Um, adults, you know, I'm gonna have more acquired diseases on the list, um, either you know, acquired heart disease, lung disease, other systemic diseases that may be contributing to or causing pulmonary hypertension. Um, you know, kind of the classic old small breed dog is classic for myxomatous mitral valve degeneration, congestive left heart failure with secondary pulmonary hypertension. But we know that all dogs of any breed can get left heart failure. Um, Westies and Pekingese are um, thought to be more prevalent for interstitial lung disease or uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, they may have a higher predisposition for that. And then again, dogs in, from endemic regions of heartworm, heartworm disease is gonna be high on my list. Um, you know, kind of that young pit bull rescue from a southern state is kind of, to me, classic for um, does this dog have, have heartworm disease. Clinical signs, uh, really it's gonna be lung signs, you know, it's pulmonary hypertension. So anywhere from a little bit of shortness of breath to full on respiratory distress, um, syncope, especially from exertion or excitement, um, or even just tiring quicker with activity. Cough is often commonly reported in dogs who have pulmonary hypertension, but the cough is usually from the primary underlying lung disease. Uh, pulmonary hypertension itself does not really cause cough, but whatever is causing the cough could cause pulmonary hypertension. So if a dog has pulmonary hypertension, just treating that without addressing the underlying cause may not actually help that dog's cough. Um, so it's some, something to, to keep in mind. On physical examination, one of, one of the big things for me is having a loud right-sided systolic murmur. You know, that's over the tricuspid valve. Um, a lot of times with the pulmonary hypertension, if you have a leak on the tricuspid valve, that leak is gonna be very high velocity, um, which is gonna make a louder murmur. Now, dogs with congestive left heart failure usually have more severe mitral regurgitation than tricuspid regurgitation. So classically for them is a loud left apical systolic murmur. So I have a dysmic dog. One of the first things I'm gonna do is, is there a murmur, is it louder on the left or right? And again, not slam dunk, but I'm gonna, just gonna put that check box in. Boy, this dog has a loud right-sided murmur and it's tachypnic. Pulmonary hypertension just jumped higher on my list. Um, in addition to tricuspid regurgitation, um, some of these dogs can also have pulmonic regurgitation. Um, you know, when the, during diastole, when that pulmonic valve closes, it's holding that high pressure in the lungs, which can make it leak. I pretty commonly find at least mild pulmonic regurgitation in dogs with um, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but I would say rarely do I hear a diastolic murmur there. You know, that's kind of a dive bomber. <laughs> Um, I'd say the, the majority of times when I have heard a diastolic murmur, it's usually um, puppies with pulmonic stenosis that also have pulmonic regurgitation. So it's reported, but rare. Um, a split second heart sound, um, again, classically um, described in people with it. I'd say I don't recognize that very often, but if you do hear like, instead of like lub dub, lub dub, you hear like lub dr, lub dr, lub dr. You know, that could be a sign that says, oh, maybe this dog does have pulmonary hypertension. Um, having signs of congestive right heart failure. So on exam, you know, you feel a distended abdomen, hepatomegaly, maybe you get a flu wave. Um, having congestive right heart failure, again, puts pulmonary hypertension higher. You can have a dog with degenerative valve disease or DCM who just has right heart failure without pulmonary hypertension. Um, but it's going to put it high on, higher on my list to say, boy, we should really look to see if there is pulmonary hypertension. Similar with right heart failure, in, in addition to the backup in the belly, you have backup in the cranial vena cava to the jugular veins as well. So you can see distended jugular veins with pulsation um, and then cyanosis. Listening to the lungs, they really can be anything. Um, I'd say you often hear at least increased bronchovesicular sounds or harsh lung sounds. Crackles are pretty common as well. Um, classically, they describe the crackles as secondary to interstitial lung disease as being very sharp 
and loud and crackly, where the crackles with congestive heart failure are supposedly more wet sounding, a little more muffled, a little softer crackles. Um, pretty subtle finding. I don't think they follow the, um, it's, it, I wouldn't hang my hat on it, but again, some checkbox where I'm, which, which side I think it's, it's going in. Um, sometimes you hear wheezes, um, sometimes uh, it's muffled heart sounds. I think the important thing to remember though is um, a lot of times our knee-jerk knee reaction is heart murmur, crackles, congestive heart failure, which a lot of times, yes, um, but pulmonary hypertension presents the same way, often with a heart murmur, crackles, um, but trying to put together the whole picture to say, okay, do I think this is heart failure or do I think this is pulmonary hypertension? So in the consensus statement, they made a list of findings that are strongly suggestive of pulmonary hypertension and findings that are possibly suggestive. Um, the ones that they said are strongly suggestive are syncope, especially with exertion or activity um, without another identifiable cause. If you have a syncopal dog coming in and um, you hook up an ECG and they have RMT, VTAC, you know, I think we have a more likely answer with, in where to, to treat. Um, respiratory distress, at, at, even at rest, um, activity or exercise terminating in uh, respiratory distress and having congestive right heart failure. Uh, findings that they said are possibly suggestive um, is basically less severe versions of those signs. So tachypnea at rest, uh, some increased respiratory effort at rest, uh, prolonged recovery from activity, um, or having like cyanotic or pale mucous membranes. So testing, uh, there's kind of two major goals when you're gonna start evaluating these dogs diagnostically. One is to assess, do we think pulmonary hypertension is present? And then the other is to try to say, okay, what do we think the underlying cause of this pulmonary hypertension is? So for any dysmic animal, you know, chest x-rays are usually where we're starting. Uh, and kind of those classic findings are tortuous, blunted pulmonary arteries, um, asymmetric radiolucent findings in the lungs. So if you have a massive PTE blocking a large branch pulmonary artery, all the branches distal to that are not gonna be getting any blood. So that you may have a one part of the lungs which looks really radiolucent, with like you can't see any of the vasculature compared to the rest of the lungs. Um, patchy diffuse alveolar infiltrates, I'd say this is probably one of the more common things that I see in dysmic dogs with pulmonary hypertension, or um, a bulge in the region of the pulmonary trunk and or right heart enlargement. So here's a picture of some radiographs um, from a dog with severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, one of, so here we go. Um, so as a cardiologist, my brain thinks often the first thing I look at is, is the left atrium big or not? Because 99% of the time, the left atrium needs to be big before congestive heart failure develops. Um, an exception to that would be a ruptured chordae tendinae where um, suddenly there's a massive amount of mitral regurgitation and the heart hasn't had time to stretch or dilate. Um, that can cause a sudden onset um, pulmonary edema. Um, so if you have a dog with sudden onset um, dyspnea and you have like a new loud left apical systolic heart murmur, I'd have ruptured cord on the list. Uh, but again, if we're hearing a loud right-sided murmur, probably not gonna be um, heart failure. So on these radiographs, uh, remember the left atrium sits as like a little backpack um, in the heart on the, the lateral here. Um, if we look here, I do. I like to do a little trick where I draw a line from the carina to the top of the caudal cava. Um, and if anything's sticking up above that, um, that's off in the left atrium. Here, if we draw that line, it goes right into it and there's no um, heart chamber up here. So I do not see evidence of left atrial enlargement. Um, the apex looks like it's being lifted up off the sternum right here. Um, you know, you've maybe increased sternal contact suggesting right heart enlargement. And on the VD here, um, again, the left atrium sits in this, um, between these bronchi here, and the circle right here is where the left atrium is. Um, and that's normal or small to me. Dogs with heart failure, you see the circle take up like the whole bottom half of the heart here. 
Um, and the left atrium has the oracle off of it, which I picture as like the body of the atrium being the body of, the, of a whale. And then the oracle like being the tail of the whale. And the way that goes is the tail comes out this way and then it comes back. So um, the left atrium sits here. And when the left atrium's big, that tail sticks out here and you can gotta get a bulge in the two to three o'clock position. I do not see the left oracle bulge here. Remember veins are ventral and central. So if we follow um, the, the veins down here, we have a big dilated pulmonary artery um, and normal pulmonary veins. Here again, a, a big pulmonary artery and a small corresponding pulmonary vein there. So everything is kind of pointing towards right heart pulmonary hypertension. And on the VD, the main pulmonary artery sits in this um, like one to two o'clock position. So this kind of bulge up here, this like shoulder, left shoulder in the heart um, is the main pulmonary artery bulge. On the laterals, it's in this area here. I feel like it's really hard and I often don't recognize it there. I've seen a few dogs where I see like a big bulge here from the main pulmonary artery, but I think that's a little bit harder to see. Um, but you can see how significant these pulmonary infiltrates are. And they're kind of distributed in a similar pattern where we see congestive left heart failure. Um, so this is where it can sometimes be tricky. Um, but these pulmonary infiltrates are not from congestive left heart failure. We, it's not from a backup of pressures from the left atrium. Um, so I would not treat these with Lasix um, because this is actually a disease of pulmonary hypertension. And there's, there's different proposed mechanisms of why these develop. Um, but essentially we want to treat the pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then there was a paper showed that sildenafil alone causes, causes infiltrates like these to, um, to resolve. We will look at uh, one more example. Um, again, this dog doesn't have the pulmonary infiltrates like that last dog does, um, but you know, we draw that line um, where the left atrium would be, nothing sticking up. I don't see left atrial enlargement. That apex looks like it's being lifted up off the heart. And then if we compare the pulmonary artery and vein, you can see the pulmonary artery is more dilated than the pulmonary vein. So again, these to me say pulmonary hypertension. If we compare that to a radiograph of a dog in congestive left heart failure, um, we draw that line and we can see there's a huge bulge of um, left atrium sticking up above the line. Um, the apex is getting pushed down which is lifting the heart up. So we can see that crime is pushed almost all the way up to the spine where normally you know, they, they diverge from each other. And the pulmonary veins are a little bit bigger than the pulmonary arteries. So you know, this is pretty classic for congestive left heart failure. So I definitely would not give this dog um, sildenafil um, and my suspicions of primary pulmonary hypertension would be low. If you have a point of care ultrasound in your clinic, um, looking for evidence of right heart failure. So looking, do I see ascites? Um, right heart fa failure happens from the uh, backup of blood uh, from the right atrium through the caudal cava into the liver veins and into the belly. So you often see a big liver with big dilated liver veins and a big dilated caudal cava. Um, all of those to me would suggest right heart failure, which would put um, pulmonary hypertension higher on the list. So when do you echo? Um, so if on all that you're like, boy, I think pulmonary hypertension is possible based on my exam, history, signalment, findings, um, x-rays, um, echo really um, is uh, what, what we wanna do next to try to say, is there pulmonary hypertension or not? And often for, sometimes you do chest x-rays, it's like, boy, the heart looks big. I can't really tell if it's left or right side enlargement. There are pulmonary infiltrates. Um, that's where I feel lucky uh, because, um, because we have echocardiography, I can look at the heart and say, this looks like pulmonary hypertension or this looks like heart failure. Um, but there are a lot of those x-rays where it's not slam dunk. It's not following the textbook. Um, so that's where um, like echocardiography can really become helpful. So the assessment of pulmonary hypertension, really the criterion standard is putting a catheter in the pulmonary artery. 
And so you do that by going through a vein and uh, often with like a Swan Gans catheter, which is a catheter that has a little balloon on it and that balloon helps direct it with blood flow. Um, so you put it through a vein and it goes, eventually makes it to the right atrium, goes through the tricuspid valve, um, into the right ventricle, you make the turn, come out the pulmonary artery, and then you, uh, once you're in the pulmonary artery, you connect it to a pressure transducer and you measure the pressure. And really that's, that's a gold standard in people. Because we can't ask dogs to lay still um, and they need anesthesia, we rarely do this. Um, and we know that dogs who are under anesthesia, um, their pulmonary artery pressures drop just from anesthesia. And we also know that dogs with severe pulmonary hypertension can become very hypotensive systemically with anesthesia and can die. So we're not doing this um, in dogs that come in in respiratory distress or ever really. Uh, really the non-invasive gold standard is echocardiography. And the two main things we're assessing are, can we measure any spectral Doppler tracings to help us get pressure estimates? And do we see secondary changes to the heart that suggest pulmonary hypertension are, is present? And it's really putting those two pieces together that, that help us come up, with, um, come up with a diagnosis. So really we're using echo to diagnose pulmonary hypertension the majority of time in dogs. Um, many of these echo finding dogs have not, there have not been great studies saying, okay, when you measure this, this is what we're getting simultaneously with a right heart catheter. There's been some studies, but they've, again, they've been under anesthesia, um, so those pressures are often lower. Um, and it's important to always interpret your findings in the context of the clinical case. If everything's screaming pulmonary hypertension, but you get a measurement that suggests not, um, you have to look at everything else and try to say, okay, am I underestimating? Am I overestimating? Is this a normal dog that I got a high reading and does it really make sense? Um, and I kind of like this, this quote from the consensus statement. You know, so clinicians should be mindful of the limitations of the echocardiographic exam um, and the inaccuracy, variability, and imprecision potentially encountered when using echo to estimate pulmonary artery pressures. So we'll, we'll go through a little bit about um, the echo findings, what we see, and this isn't really to teach you how to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, but hopefully seeing some of it helps make sense about um, uh, what, like what we're looking at and um, what we're doing and how we get the answer. Uh, looks like I have a question. Uh, is Lysix going to be useful and for harmful in a point of care situation? where the physical exam and radiographs um, are all we have and echo may not be an option for several months due to waiting lists. Yeah, uh, our waiting list sucks. Um, it's, it's really hard. So I think it's always fair when you have a dysmic animal um, to start with a dose of Lasix. You know, a single reasonable dose, like for dogs, I usually go about two migs per kg. For cats, I go about one mig per kg. Um, a single dose is unlikely to be harmful. And until you start going down that path of, is this pulmonary hypertension or not? I always think a, a, a dose or two is always fair until you can hopefully get the patient more stable and get more diagnostics. Um, the, I think if the x-rays are slam dunk one way or the other, um, then I, you know, obviously if it's pulmonary hypertension, I probably would not start Lasix. If, um, you know, if it's slam dunk heart failure, I, I would. If it's questionable, um, I think it's fair to say, okay, let's, in general, if, if I'm questioning things, I'm gonna err on the side of heart failure because not treating that is more likely to cause the animal to die. So if I'm up in the air, I'm gonna err on the side of treating for heart failure. Now, I think aggressively treating heart failure and an animal's not improving is often a red flag to say, boy, we should maybe reassess and say, Maybe this isn't heart failure. Um, the, you know, for animals that are really dysmic, they probably need to be hospitalized anyway. Um, so I would recommend, um, you know, if, if you're not able to manage them in your clinic, um, referring them through our emergency department um, where they can get, you know, oxygen hospitalization. And we can hopefully try to work them in as an in-house consult um, throughout the day. 
Um, we're not always able to do it same day. You know, we are trying to overbook our appointments, um, but we're trying to do our best to try to work in the emergent emergency cases as possible. Um, so if they're really unstable, then I would recommend sending them through the ER. Um, Dr. Rose and the other cardiologists and myself have started doing like a remote consult service too because of how far we're booked out. We're, we're doing like an official uh, like write-up and case review, um, kind of similar to like radiology reports, but more of like a case review um, and looking at x-rays and we can write that up and say, here's a plan in a stable patient before they're able to come to their appointment. Um, but Dr. Rose and myself are also happy to, um, to just help support you unofficially. If you're like, boy, you know, I, I don't think the client can afford a full consult or, you know, they're on the waiting list, but I'd love just to get you to look at these x-rays. Um, we're always happy to just kind of look at them and be like, boy, you know, this looks like pulmonary hypertension. I do this, or boy, this looks like heart failure. Or, I don't know. Let's try this treatment plan first. So, um, we're, we're doing our best to try to support all of you referring vets the best we can. Um, and we're doing our best to try to catch up on the backlog. I know we've gone from several months to a few months, but it's still a few months, which, um, which sucks. But hope, hopefully that, uh, hope, hopefully that answers that question. Um, so, uh, tricuspid regurgitant velocity is really the, one of the main things that we try to say, okay, what is the systolic pressure? So, um, there's several assumptions about it, <clears throat> but essentially when the right ventricle is contracting, the pulmonic valve opens to pump blood out into the pulmonary artery. Um, and as that blood flows out, the pressure equalizes between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So the first assumption is that during systole, those pressures are gonna be the same. So if you have an obstruction or pulmonic stenosis, that doesn't count anymore because that pressure is not gonna equalize. But assuming there's no obstruction or pulmonic stenosis, um, you assume the right ventricle pressure is gonna be the same as the pulmonary artery pressure and the lung pressure. Um, and then as long as you have a leak on the tricuspid valve, which is normally closed to help push blood forward out to the lungs, um, you can measure the speed of that leak to estimate the pressure. Um, and if you think about if you have like um, a water bottle with a hole poked in it, the harder you squeeze that bottle and the higher the pressure gets inside the bottle, the faster that water jet's gonna come out. So same idea, the higher the pulmonary pressure is, the faster that tricuspid regurgitation is gonna be. Um, and we use the modified Bernoulli equation um, which you don't need to know, but it's four times the velocity squared, and that gives you the estimated pressure gradient. And then technically, you're supposed to add in the right atrial pressures to get the final pulmonary artery pressure. Um, with the limited studies that have been done, it seems like those right atrial pressure estimates are often flawed. So they're recommending that you don't actually add those in, but just be aware of those. Um, like if a dog's in congestive right heart failure with a high pressure right atrium, the pressure difference is gonna be lower, so the speed of the tricuspid regurgitation is gonna be lower, even though the pulmonary hypertension may still be more severe. Um, so that's just one of the limitations you just have to be aware of. Um, it's also um, affected by other things as well. Uh, if you have if your right ventricle starting to fail and it's not contracting as hard, that tricuspid valve leak is going to be slower, but that doesn't mean your pulmonary hypertension is any better. So um, there's a lot of uh, potential variability and uh, over underestimating. Um, it's in, in technique wise, it's important that you try to get your um, continuous wave cursor as parallel as possible to the flow. You optimize your gain settings so you're not over under, um, not over under gaining. Um, you want to make sure you're measuring correctly. You're measuring the profile, not like the little wispy feathered edge. And you may need to do um, at atypical imaging planes to try to get as lined up as possible with that tricuspid valve leak. Um, <laughs> this is an example of a good quality uh, profile. Um, you, know, you can see uh, the envelope is it's fully filled in. It's all uh, uniform. Uh, it's stretch so that way the signal's taking up as much vertical room as possible, which will give you a more accurate measurement. Um, you know, this is an example of where you see the nice profile, but then you see that wispy feathered edge at the end. Uh, technically, they say you should measure, measure the chin, not the beard. Um, 
but it can sometimes be hard to tell, well, where's that transition work from wispiness to good profile? So um, that's one potential way that you could over or underestimate the severity of the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, based on a paper <clears throat> from a while ago, I often use kind of the gradient cutoffs of 35, 55, or 75 as mild, moderate, severe. In the consensus statement, they're, they were suggesting maybe moving away from that and maybe using a cutoff of 46 as to say, is there pulmonary hypertension, yes or no? Um, and then using that in combination with some of the other echo findings to try to say, do we think there's pulmonary hypertension? Is it significant? Does it need to be treated? In addition to measuring the tricuspid regurgitation, you can measure the pulmonic regurgitation to estimate diastolic pressures rather than systolic pressures. Um, the peak pulmonic regurgitation velocity um, is about the mean pulmonary pressure and then the end diastolic, um, which is uh, right here, would be more of an estimate of the diastolic pulmonary artery pressures. Um, and sometimes when there's not tricuspid regurgitation, um, I'll use this, these to say, boy, you know, I don't, I can't diagnose systolic pulmonary hypertension, but I see there's at least moderate diastolic, so there's probably is pulmonary hypertension present. So in addition to the spectral profiles, there's um, three main anatomic sites that the consensus statement says that you're supposed to tie together um, to uh, try to get this diagnosis or not. And one is looking at the ventricles, both the left and right ventricles, say, so do we see remodeling or changes in those? Um, another is looking at the pulmonary artery itself and the flow profiles through that pulmonary artery. And then the last is assessing the right atrium and caudal cava. So we'll just briefly talk about those real quick. Um, so site one, the ventricles. So classic with severe pulmonary hypertension, um, you get flattening of the interventricular septum. Uh, remember, normal left ventricular pressure in systole is the same as your systolic blood pressure, so about 120. Remember, in the lung, systolic is normally about 20. So you have about 100 millimeter mercury pressure um, from the left ventricle pushing up on that septum. So that's why your left ventricle usually looks round. Um, but as the right ventricular pressures equalize or go higher than the left ventricle pressures, that septum starts to flatten down. Um, you can also see um, underfilling of the left ventricle. And the way I think about it is the blood's kind of getting stopped up at the high pressures of the lungs. So you have less coming through the lungs to the left atrium and left ventricle. So a lot of times the left ventricle will be small and it's also getting squished by that high pressure in the, left, uh, in the right ventricle. So you often have small squashed left ventricle. Um, you can, like any muscle that's working hard, over time that right ventricle will hypertrophy and thicken. And then eventually, or uh, you can see right ventricular systolic dysfunction as well. Um, so hopefully these will load up. Hopefully, looks like they're running pretty well on my computer. Hopefully they look okay for you. Um, if we, so the top uh, images here um, are a normal dog. This is our uh, left, uh, sorry, left, left-sided long axis view, poor chamber. Uh, I think the order of those words are wrong, but uh, this is our left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. Um, you, from this view, the left side of the heart looks bigger than the right side, which is normal. Um, and if we rotate the probe 90 degrees, looking at the same heart here, here's that nice round left ventricle like we were talking about. The papillary muscles here make it look like a mushroom. And then the right ventricle we can see is this crescent kind of sitting on top of that. If we compare that to the bottom images, which is a dog with pulmonary hypertension, um, if you can, on this long axis view, you can see how the right heart looks bigger than the left heart. Um, and that, that left heart's getting squashed down, it's tiny, the right heart's bigger. And on the short axis, you can see how the septum is becoming almost completely flat during systole. Um, and the left ventricle is smaller. Uh, you know, it should be this size, but you can see it's squashed just because of the pressure squashing it down and that blood's not coming through um, to the left heart as well. And the right ventricle itself is dilated and the wall is thickened. Now, up here you can see how the right ventricle wall looks thinner than the septum and left ventricular free wall. 
here you can see it's the same to, and sometimes it's even thicker. Um, so these, so these bottom images are kind of classic for this is pulmonary hypertension. And because that left heart and left atrium are so small, when I see these bottom images, I can say this is not congestive heart failure. Um, so, you know, let's not treat for that with Lasix. Let's focus on investigating causes of pulmonary hypertension and treating pulmonary hypertension primarily. Um, so the second site is looking at the pulmonary artery. Um, with chronic higher pressures, it can start to stretch and dilate. Normally the pulmonary artery in the area should be about the same in size, the same size. So if your pulmonary artery is way bigger than the aorta, that suggests the pressures could be higher there. Um, and we talked about measuring the diastolic um, pulmonic regurgitation leak velocity. Um, there's something called the pulmonary artery distensibility index, where you look at normally when the heart beats the right branch pulmonary artery, um, gets bigger and smaller with the pumping of blood. But if the pressure is high, it's going to stay distended. And when the blood pumps, it, you're not going to see that distensibility. And so there's ways to measure that on echo and say, how much is that distending? Um, uh, looking at the flow profiles of the pulmonary artery as well. Um, again, these start to become subtle. And I don't think they have great sensitivity or specificity. Uh, but just briefly, a normal pulmonary artery flow pulmonary artery flow profile. Um, it gradually comes up and gradually goes back down. And with pulmonary hypertension, it can go up very quickly and then uh, come down more slowly. Um, this is again kind of showing normal um, compared to severe pulmonary hypertension. And then that flow profile can also get a notch in it too on its way down. And that's uh, kind of classic for pulmonary hypertension as well. But I see dogs with severe pulmonary hypertension where the flow profiles look normal. I see normal dogs with notches in them. Um, so again, not perfect, but again, checkbox pulmonary hypertension or not. Um, and then the last site to look on at ECHO is the right heart. Again, uh, is the right atrium enlarged? Um, it's not always, but especially if you have a significant tricuspid leak, um, it, it can enlarge. Um, and then looking at, is that causing right heart failure? So is the caudal cava dilated? Um, I look where it both enters the right atrium and then where it crosses the diaphragm as well. And a normal caudal cava collapses with breathing where it, where it crosses the diaphragm. But if an animal is going into um, right heart failure, that will become distended um, and uh, um, may not collapse as well. Um, I see someone's raising their hand, and I don't know what that means. Um, so I don't know, Heidi, I don't know if there's something if you want me to do or check. Um, um, it looks like, can you see the question? Because I can read it to you if you can't. Um, I saw the, I see the one about Lasix being used for harmful, which I talked okay. about a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I'll just reiterate. Um, uh, I think sometimes people accidentally raise their hands. Oh. Um, okay. So uh, instead of hand raising, if you would type a question into the Q&A box, that would be great because those we can, we can do something about. Cool. Thanks. Um, so the um, consensus statement, uh, it, so they try to say, okay, let's, you know, mentally we're often trying to put all these together. They said, let's try to define this. Where, so let's take the tricuspid regurgitant velocity, whether you have changes in the ventricles, the pulmonary artery, or the right atrium, and put that together and say that makes the pulmonary, possibility of pulmonary hypertension low, intermediate, or high. So they're, they're trying to define that a little bit more. Um, so, is that kind of talked about the identifying with pulmonary hypertension, yes or no? And then the rest of diagnostic testing is what's the underlying cause and um, which category do I think it is. Um, so investigating lung disease, um, CT angiography can be helpful. Um, it, CT helps you evaluate the pulmonary parenchyma a little bit better than chest x-rays alone. Um, the uh, uh, angiography also helps you evaluate whether there's pulmonary arteries that are blocked by clots. Um, and then lung biopsies, I, you know, they are going to give you more of a definitive diagnosis about what is the lung disease. 
At this point in veterinary medicine, um, I don't think that's necessarily going to change our treatment options because, um, but as time goes on and we learn more about these diseases, maybe getting a specific diagnosis is going to say, boy, this is a therapy we want to do, or this is one that's not. But until that, until we get to that point, taking a dog that's having difficulty breathing and cutting off some of their lungs seems a little more drastic, especially if it's not going to change what, what we're going to do. Um, let's see. All right, I got a second question here. Uh, should pulmonary hypertension always be considered as a possible primary cause of right-sided heart failure? Do we still treat the heart failure present? Uh, Good question. So you can, um, so in order for there to be right heart failure, you either need a leak, and uh, I may be oversimplifying that, simplifying that I may be told wrong by um, others, but I usually think you either need to have a leak there to cause volume overload, or you need to have right heart dysfunction and weakening, not causing the volume to back up. Um, so a lot of times this is in dogs who you know, are probably older, have some degree of valve degeneration, and sometimes that pulmonary hypertension makes that tricuspid valve leak way worse. And in some of these dogs, after we treat the pulmonary hypertension, I've seen the tricuspid regurgitation actually go away or become minimal. Um, so I think, and to answer your question, I think if you see right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension can't, should be on the list. Um, and we'll talk about treatment a little bit later, but essentially, if there's fluid, then yes, I would um, treat with Lasix. But I would, but you're treating for the right heart failure and not the left heart failure. And you need to be more cautious because we saw in those echo images how tiny that left ventricle can be. And while the Lasix will help clear the fluid in the belly and help clear the right heart failure, it also is going to volume underload your left ventricle a little bit as well. Um, so if there's heart failure, yes, I treat with Lasix. I'm just maybe a little bit more cautious, and I'm probably going to try to optimize Pemobendin or Vetmedin more, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in a little bit, rather than going big on diuretics. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. So um, yes, I would use Lasix, but I'd just be a little bit more cautious, just knowing uh, potential effects. Oh, and I see my own video now. Good. Uh, all right, so hypercoagulability. So a lot of times if we're not finding causes of pulmonary hypertension, um, think about what other, what could an animal be throwing clots and why would an animal be doing that? So investigating other diseases that make an animal hypercoagulable. So uh, IMHA, Cushing's disease, protein losing nephropathy or enteropathy, sepsis, having cancer anywhere in the bottle, bottle in the body, um, and DIC. So um, investigating some of these other diseases. So sometimes a full pulmonary hypertension workup starts to be, um, I think I get a little more into the testing, like doing full lab work, looking at urinalysis, urine protein creatinine ratio, abdominal ultrasound, um, platelets, D-dimers. Um, you know, if we, if we're not Finding a cause, those are sometimes the routes I go down to say, is this animal hypercoagulable? Um, ACTH stem, all that stuff. So there's tons of flow charts in the um, consensus statement where um, they try to help direct you towards, you know, what, what do I think the underlying cause is? So do this, do you see this? So it starts to become a little bit exhaustive, but just knowing that they're there, if you're like, okay, I really need to, to know which direction I should be going. Um, so I'm just kind of going through them all, just showing you there's lots of trees and lots of branches and um, ways to try to investigate. So let's see, we have um, uh, about 15 more minutes and then um, we'll take questions. So I think that should be good timing with um, things here. Um, and feel free to post questions as we go too. Uh, so treatment. Uh, so we let's say, okay, we've diagnosed pulmonary hypertension um let's treat this and so there's really kind of three main treatment strategies for this uh, one is trying to just decrease the risk of progression of pulmonary hypertension or the complications that can occur from it 
Um, the second is addressing the underlying cause of the pulmonary hypertension. And then the third is specifically treating the pulmonary hypertension itself. So to start with the first one, um, strategies to kind of decrease the risks of progression or complications. Um, you know, I think exercise restriction is one. You know, I think my goal and probably your goal in treating any disease is getting the animal back to quality of life. And um, taking an animal, putting it in a small oxygen cage and letting it live its life out there um, may not be quality of life for that animal or for that family to enjoy that animal. Um, so, you know, I want, I want the dog being able to do what it wants to do. Uh, but knowing in the acute management period, um, yeah, I mean, if they're running and collapsing and passing out and turning blue, we, we need to hold them back. But hopefully with our treatment strategies, hopefully we can help them uh, improve their exercise tolerance. And again, um, I, my goal is always to get an animal back to doing what it wants to do, um, to let the family enjoy their time with the animal and the animal enjoy the time with the family. Um, so I'm, I'm always a little cautious about um, being a little bit too um, restrictive on, on things. Uh, does, I got another question. Does a cardiac probe EMP test help at all in differentiating heart failure from pulmonary hypertension? Great question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think, so looking at what can cause BNP to elevate um, on the long list of things, one is congestive heart failure. Another thing on the list is pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so, and I don't know if there's been great studies comparing the two. I, I feel like it's more likely if you get a normal BNP that I would have pulmonary hypertension higher on the list in a dog compared to heart failure. Um, I may have to review some more of the literature to see if there's actually been any studies looking at predictive values of that, um, but I think it's muddy. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that helps. But yeah, I, I would say it's not, it's not gonna be slam dunk. If you get a normal BNP, I would have lung disease higher on the list. But if it's abnormal, it still could be either. So that, I think that's how I would interpret it. Um, in cats, um, which it, we're not really talking about in this talk, um, I do think it's maybe more helpful um, from lung disease, which they, cats often don't have pulmonary hypertension associated with, with asthma, though they can. Um, but BNPs are more often normal with primary lung disease compared to heart failure in cats, which has been documented. Um, but with uh, dogs and pulmonary hypertension, I, I don't, I don't know that we have anything to show that. Um, so strategies to decrease the risk of progression or complications of pulmonary hypertension, exercise restrictions, um, trying to um, you know, prevent respiratory diseases, staying away from situations where they can get kennel cough or vaccinating for kennel cough if they have to be in that situation. Um, avoidance of pregnancy, partially because that can worsen pulmonary hypertension and these animals may have some genetic predisposition for why they have pulmonary hypertension in the first place. Avoiding high altitudes and air travel. Um, oxygen is a pulmonary artery dilator, um, which is why sometimes when you put these dogs in oxygen, they dramatically improve even without any other therapies. Higher altitudes have lower oxygen tension, so you can worsen pulmonary hypertension at high altitudes. Um, uh, and then avoiding non-essential wellness procedures. You know, if a dog has severe pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, their risks of hypotension and systemic hypotension and death are higher with anesthesia. So I probably wouldn't do a routine dental cleaning on them. Um, but if a dog has abscess, pain, bleeding, can't control it with medications and they have reasonably controlled pulmonary hypertension, I think that's where we start doing the risk benefit analysis saying, okay, is quality of life bad without it? Uh, and then, so specific treatment strategies then of the six um, classifications and underlying causes. Um, and we're, we're not gonna go into this too much, but essentially it's fix, treat the underlying cause. Um, with shunts, um, if they reverse right to left from the pulmonary hypertension, um, animals can be polycythemic, so monitoring their PCBs and treating that if needed. Um, dogs, 
Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about um, dogs with the class two pul um, pulmonary hypertension secondary to severe left heart disease and left heart failure. Uh, I alluded to this before, um, but taking a dog in congestive heart failure, giving it sildenafil is gonna make it worse and could kill it. So the goal is really to say, can we decrease those left atrial pressures? Um, and uh, so we do that with standard heart failure therapy, um, Lasix, Pimobendin, you know, Spironolactone and Alpro, those can all help decrease left heart pressures, which can help decrease the backup. Um, so essentially we want to control congestive heart failure first. Um, and then um, sometimes we do need to add in heart failure or sildenafil because sometimes they can get a reactive secondary component. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. Uh, another question. Oh, I think maybe I missed uh, the same time. Any thoughts on hyperbaric oxygen therapy for pulmonary hypertension or congestive heart failure? Um, I don't know a ton about hyperbaric stuff. Um, it's pretty cool to me because you know, it helps drive more oxygen in. So I think it can help. Um, and I don't know where, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if the U has that for dogs or not. You know, I think it can be something that can help in the acute management, um, like having them like in a little pressure chamber. Um, but again, thinking about my goal is to get an animal stable and home. And you know, that may help in the acute management phase, but you know, they're probably not gonna have hyperbaric at home. Um, so I, I don't know a ton about it, but I imagine it could be helpful in the acute management. Um, you know, I think people getting oxygen concentrators and oxygen at home, you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. You know, I think it can be beneficial. Um, I had a dog with end stage pulmonary hypertension where he had the dog sleep in there um, and the dog ended up spending a lot of his life in there, but was able to bring him out sometimes. Um, again, my goal is to try to get them stable without that, but it may be something that could be helpful during um, uh flare-ups or uh, bad um, periods where they have a flare-up of the pulmonary hypertension and become dyspneic at home. Uh, yeah, so again, treating left heart disease, trying to optimize that therapy um, is really the first thing that you wanna do when um, treating pulmonary hypertension from uh, severe left heart disease. Uh, Class three pulmonary hypertension from primary lung diseases. Um, essentially, it's try to figure out what the lung disease is and treat it if possible. Um, sometimes that may even just involve simple things like weight loss, um, environmental modifications to improve air quality, optimize humidity. Um, the um, dogs who are in smoking households, I think, have a higher incidence of primary lung disease. So maybe having them not smoke around the animal. Um, and then trying to you know, recognize triggers, like does a dog get excited, bark, pull on the collar, send him into a coughing fit into respiratory distress, trying to identify those and avoid those if possible. Um, you know, some diseases may not respond well, like pulmonary fibrosis. You know, oral or inhaled steroids may be beneficial, um, but uh, may, may not treating pneumonias with antibiotics, um, you know, treating cancer potentially, um, managing brachycephalic airway syndrome, you know, maybe treating it earlier before it starts to cause issues. Uh, pulmonary thromboemboli, um, it, in general in people, they prefer anticoagulants over antiplatelet drugs. So heparin, low molecular weight heparin, like anoxaparin or deltaparin. Um, a lot of these newer oral anticoagulants, uh, like apixaban or rivaroxaban, are becoming more and more, um, shown to be more and more beneficial in people, starting to become the standard of care. I'm starting to use them in cats, um, but for a cat or cat-sized dog. Um, the cheapest I've found it is around $130-ish a month if you can find a pharmacy that takes a GoodRx coupon. So for a bigger dog, it's likely still gonna be cost prohibitive. There may be some benefits of clopidogrel, but 
Um, again, the anticoagulants seem to be more of the standard of care in people. Um, and then if you have an acute massive PTE, um, there may be a place for TPA to try to bust that clot and break it down. Um, but you know, just knowing that can cause acute massive hemorrhage and death. I had one dog during my residency that had this and they tried TPA infusion um, and I don't think he did well. I think within 24 hours or something, he, um, yeah, he did not improve. Uh, Heartworm disease, um, I'll be honest, whenever um, I get a call with a question about, uh, this is where I'm at in the heartworm disease treatment process. Um, I'm often going on the American Heartworm Society website. I'm opening the dog uh, guidelines summary and I'm kind of refreshing my brain. Okay, at this point in the treatment, I recommend these things, have we done these things? Um, so I often go on this and use it as a cheat sheet um, for how to, to manage heartworm disease in dogs. And then, uh, you no know, multifactorial address the different problems. If you have like a heart-based mass blocking the um, pulmonary artery, um, you can consider radiation therapy. I know Dr. Keller in our oncology department is starting to use, I think, Palladia. There's some like a case study of like four dogs or something that showed maybe it helps. Um, but I think we've anecdotally maybe had some good success um, with a couple patients. Excuse me. Um, stenting uh, the artery. Um, I've never done that, but theoretically possible. And then finally, um, treating the pulmonary hypertension specifically. Um, Sildenafil um, is really the only af good affordable option we have right now in veterinary medicine. If people have thousands of dollars every couple of weeks, um, I had one patient on ambrosetin, um, which uses this endothelin pathway. Um, but sildenafil uses the nitric oxide cyclic GMP pathway, um, where um, it's a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, which prevents cyclic GMP from breaking down, and cyclic G GMP is a vasodilator in the pulmonary arteries. Um, there's also some evidence that L-arginine, which is a precursor to nitric oxide synthesis, giving that may help in with this pathway as well. Um, we still need more data on it, but I know more and more cardiologists are starting to add an L-arginine as something that potentially could help with pulmonary hypertension. But a lot of these other pathways, the drugs are either injectable or infusion only, or they're just way too expensive right now for us in veterinary medicine. Uh, the downside about sildenafil, well, the good things are it's now cheap and it's kind of dirt cheap now, which is really great. Like six years ago, I remember it was like thousands of dollars a month. Um, but it's cheap, it has a relatively short half-life, so ideally should be given every eight hours, although I have many dogs where I give it Q12 once they're stable and doing well. Um, Tadalafil um, or Cialis is um, similar to Sildenafil, but it has a longer half-life. And, and a study showed that it was, showed similar hemodynamic improvements to sildenafil. I have not used it personally. Um, talking with uh, Dr. Callahan at UW-Madison, who's one of the, um, I'd say, big names in pulmonary hypertension research in dogs right now. She's used it a few times, but anecdotally, she does not feel like she's gotten better success than sildenafil. Um, but uh, yeah, the L-arginine we, we talked about already. And uh, kind of coming back to some of the questions about uh, heart failure, um, you know, we want to make sure that left heart disease is well controlled first. And if a dog still has some pulmonary hypertension with controlled left heart disease, I'm probably not going to treat it. Um, but uh, sometimes we have that left heart failure well controlled, but left atrial pressure estimates are better on the echo, uh, but we're still getting severe pulmonary hypertension and the dog's still clinical. So he's collapsing, passing out, exercise intolerant. In those instances, I will add in um, low dose sildenafil, like maybe half a mg per kg instead of one to two mg per kg, Q12. Um, but I'm always a little hesitant, um, but a lot of these dogs will benefit from it. If they have like a reactive uh, vasoconstrictive component of their pulmonary hypertension, it really can help them a lot. Uh, Pemobendin may have some cross reactivity. Um, it's a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor instead of phosphodiesterase 5. 
Um, but the other thoughts are, well, maybe the improvement is just by decreasing the left atrial pressure. But femobendin is one of the drugs that is good for both heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. So a lot of times I'm going to be optimizing that. And then kind of getting back to that previous question, if there is right heart failure in ascites, I will add in Lasix, just being aware that I may be volume underloading my um, left ventricle a little bit more. Um, so I'm maybe a little bit more cautious with it. But if I do the echo, a dog has severe pulmonary hypertension, a volume underloaded left heart, especially if it's been receiving a lot of Lasix, but it's right atrium's not huge and it's caudal cave is not big and there's no right heart failure. I may even be putting these animals on fluids um, in addition to treating their heart failure. Um, so, uh, so it looks like I have uh, I think another question. A uh, rough idea of what sildenafil costs per month. Um, I don't know why, but it may be, I don't know if it's a mistake, but I feel like at AERC, our cost of sildenafil is cheaper than I've found at like human pharmacies. So um, we have the 20 milligram tablets. They also come as 80s, but I think those are more expensive. And I think the typical Viagra comes as 80s, but we have the, the 20 milligram tablets. And for a small dog, I mean, I, I'm talking like less than $20 a month, I think. And even for some of these big dogs, they're on like three to four tablets three times a day. Even then, I, I think it's like still less than $40 to $50 a month. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but you know, I, I often go on GoodRx just to kind of get a good idea of cost at different pharmacies. You just always have to be careful because sometimes you'll send in the script and the pharmacy will choose a name brand and the client will be like, uh, they just said it's going to be $2,500 for my sildenafil. So um, you just want to make sure that they're um, uh, getting the generic and they're not paying crazy amounts. Uh, so yes, oxygen therapy, um, oxygen is a pulmonary artery dilator. Um, so just, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes dogs with pulmonary hypertension respond really well to putting them in oxygen, because uh, it dilates the pulmonary arteries. Um, let's see, and then, uh, so Denifil has also been used anecdotally for megasophagus. Is it contraindicated in pets with a murmur and our cardiomegaly, but not currently congestive heart failure? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, I think it kind of just depends where they're at in the um, spectrum of disease severity. Um, you know, I think like if they're right on the edge where, you know, their left atrium's huge, that pump, that, the left atrial pressures are backing up into the lungs um, and you drop the pulmonary pressures, that could be enough to push them into congestive heart failure. Um, if they have mild to moderate disease, it's probably not going to. Um, I think it's kind of the same idea of um, using corticosteroids. You know, if an animal's on the edge of heart failure, it may be enough just to cause a little bit of volume overload and push them into heart failure. Now, that being said, there's, I've seen cats with normal echoes. You give them prednisone, their heart gets huge, and they go into heart failure. You stop the prednisone, their heart looks like it goes back to normal. So I, would just, I don't know of any cases um, of your scenario, although I don't know, I haven't seen many cases that are on sildenafil for megasophagus. Um, so sorry, I, I think I'm kind of rambling and saying I don't know. But theoretically, I would think if they're on the edge, it could push them over the edge. I think that is, I think that's all the questions are on here. Um, if anyone has any other questions, uh, feel free to post them. Uh, hopefully that was helpful though, and just reviewing everything. Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to us either over email um, or call or voicemail if you have a specific case or even just a specific question about this. Thank you so much, Dr. George.